There we go. Thank you. Good morning. Hope everyone had a good Christmas. If you're like me, you got another one to go probably, maybe. I don't know. Uh, time to get them all done. That's all right. Let's uh, begin with a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the, the holiday season and for the time for us to slow down and spend with family. And uh, Father, we pray that we'll always cherish those, those moments. Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with all of our sick, that especially those that are battling cancer. Pray that you will heal them, Father, and give them strength. We pray that you will be their families, Father, and, and grant them some measure of peace as, uh, from the worry that they have for them. And Father, we pray that you'll be with uh, all of our number who have lost loved ones over the past year. We pray that you will uh, comfort them, that you will help us to comfort them in some way as well. Father, we are so thankful for your son that we have this avenue of prayer to come before you to make our needs known to you, Father. We're thankful for his words and for his example, and it's in his blessed name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is my last Sunday, at least for a while. Uh, next week, we have the uh, joint service out at the Expo, right? At the Expo? Yeah. Uh, what time is that, Dean? 10 o'clock. Okay. And then the next week, I think Randy's going to take over the class, and we'll be starting our Jesus uh, study of Jesus over the next year, the coordinated study for the whole congregation. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, the lesson this morning, I purposely saved it to last. Uh, it's actually chapter two in the book we've been using, but uh, I wanted to save it because um, two reasons, really. It's that time of year where we kind of do our New Year's resolutions and reevaluate what we've done this year and maybe change some things coming year. And uh, I wanted to put this before you to think about. And then also the project that we've got coming up with the new building and the benevolence program we're trying to get started and up and running next year um, to think about that as well because it's it's all tied into our topic this morning which is which is poverty and this may seem like a odd topic because in terms of a countercultural study I mean all of our other topics have been somewhat um, easy to understand why we're different than the culture around us, especially in regards to the sexuality topics that we've talked about the last couple of weeks, abortion and so forth. Everybody agrees that poverty is bad, right? That's Both political parties will agree that poverty is bad. All philosophies agree that. Um, atheists even agree that poverty is bad, okay? Um, The reason we're going to talk about it as a part of this cultural study is how we react to it, okay? There's a very different prescription laid out um, in the Gospels or in the Bible, in the New Testament, rather than, uh, than how the culture deals with it. For the most part, our cultural deals with it on an encounter basis when you're confronted with poverty. Um, you know, maybe this time of year, you're walking into Walmart. I hadn't been to Walmart in ages. But if you walk into Walmart, and there's it used to be the Salvation Army set up out there. Did they do that this year? Yep. Okay. And so you may have encountered that, and you feel, well, what have I got here? Let me dig down in there and throw some change in there. Okay. Or maybe somebody on a street corner with a sign saying they need help, and you encounter that, and you are uh, feel compelled to, to help them. Um, maybe it's a commercial on TV. Okay. But it's usually on a one off type basis. You'll make the contribution, help them, help you feel better about it, and then you kind of go on about your day. Is that ring true? Do you think? That's kind of the way, it's at least the way our culture deals with it for the most part. And I found it's true for me. That's the kind of the way that I've dealt with poverty. Um, in the past. And some of that is um, 
Don't we have government programs to deal with poverty? We do. What are, what are some of those? Some of y'all work in that area that you help people get that help. Welfare? Food stamps? Medicaid? WIC? Okay. Lots of good, lots of good programs out there to get people help. But, um, which they're all good, but on the other side, we kind of feel relieved from the responsibility to help to some degree, don't we? Because they've got welfare and they've got food stamps. And, well, you know, I seen the old gal down there had two cartons of cigarettes and buying her food with food stamps, <laughs> you know? Right? And what does that do to your... Makes you don't want to help? Yeah. Makes you... Well, I pay a lot of taxes, right? We all pay a lot of taxes to support these programs that are going out there. And so what happens is, and you see comments on Facebook and social media about the waste that's involved in it. And we know people that, that are on programs. And a lot of times the programs have made the problem worse. Now, not, not completely. Poverty has gotten better in our country. They have helped a lot of people. They've lifted a lot of people out of poverty who've taken it and used it the right way. We don't want to throw a blanket of condemnation on the programs, but they're often abused, right? They're so ill-conceived that they've made the problem worse in a lot of ways. Um, you know, back in the early, I think it was 70s, I should have done a little research on this, they changed the policy so that if it was a single mother with two children, she got more money than if it was a mother and a father in a home. And so what happened is that people would leave, separate, dissolve the marriage so that they could get more government assistance. And it destroyed the nuclear family. This was especially uh, damaging to inner city populations. Okay, And the more kids you had, the more help you got. Well, that's, that's, that's ill-conceived. That doesn't work very well. And uh, it has lots of issues with it. But the, probably the part that we need to more, be more concerned about is it builds up an underlying contempt for the poor. Do you think that's true? Yes. There's, a, there's kind of an underlying resentment in our society. Well, I mean, we live in the greatest country in the world, right? Everybody's got three cars, three TVs, a home or two, and all the mortgages to prove it. And if you're poor in this country, it's because you're lazy, a drunk, a druggie. Is that kind of our attitude? Yes, but it's not necessarily true. Yes, that's exactly right. It's not necessarily true, right? And we know it's not true in every circumstance, but we tend to just throw a blanket on all of it, and we have this contempt for poverty in our country because we are so wealthy. And so that's the reason this is a, a topic for our, our countercultural study. Um, okay. What is poverty? I'm going to give you a few statistics here. Definitions. Absolute poverty refers to the deprivation of basic human needs, which commonly includes food, water, sanitation, clothing, shelter, and health care. Absolute poverty is when you don't have one or more of those things. Okay. Absolute <laughs> poverty in our country is a pretty rare thing, if at all. Okay. We have more relative poverty. Relative poverty is defined contextually as economic inequality in the location or society in which people live. So in the Eastern Africa, Sudan, you might find millions of people that are suffering from absolute poverty. They don't have those basic needs that they need to survive. Food, water, and so forth. Relative poverty is measured in terms of the region that you live in. Even here in the United States, the, the the level of poverty changes depending on what region you live in, right? Different cost of living in different parts of our country. 
even within Oklahoma. Yeah. I heard it. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't remember where I saw it or read it or something that Pittsburgh County is the, one of the worst counties in Oklahoma. Yeah. I, I, I don't have anything from Pittsburgh County, but I got a statistic on Oklahoma here. Let me get to that. Most Americans will spend at least one year below the poverty line at some point between the ages of 25 and 75. Most Americans. Most of y'all probably already done that, been there and done that, right? When you're young, um, you would have lived, Christy and I lived below the poverty line for several years early in our marriage. In November 2019, the U.S. Census Bureau said more than 10.5% of the population lived in poverty. This is actually down from 16% in 2012. So there's been improvements that have been made, okay? Now, 2020 with the pandemic, I don't know what those numbers are going to be, okay? I know the government pumped a lot of money out there to make sure people did not suffer. Um, so I don't think it's going to change that much, but... In 2019, more than one in seven Oklahomans, 15.2% 15 15 or 583,000 people were living below the federal poverty line, which is $26,200 for a family of four. Okay. So poverty here in Oklahoma is worse than, well, not really, I guess. Uh, yeah, it is. is is worse here than it is the rest of the country. Now, we're... I don't think we're in the top 10 in terms of the poor states, okay? I think Mississippi may be the poorest state. New Mexico is a very poor state. Oklahoma's, Oklahoma's in the teens, I think. Um, in 2020, 10.5% of the households faced food insecurity. That is 38 million people, including 12 million children. What's food insecurity? Yeah, so we get towards the last week of the month and we're not sure we got enough to buy food. Okay. That's here in the United States. Yeah. 12 million children live in that environment. I don't know, many of y'all know Scott Walker who works with uh, Shared Blessings. That's a big, big effort that they have uh, is helping these kids get meals, make sure they've got <laughs> meals at home. Okay. Last year, I suspect it was worse because the schools were out. Randy Mobby can give us some insight into this, but schools were out. A lot of those kids depend on that breakfast and dinner for their main meals of the day. They don't get it when they get back home. Okay. I yeah. remember uh, when Glenda was teaching out at Frank, she had a child, a little boy that uh, they'd go in and eat breakfast, you know. That was the one meal he had, and he'd always – they'd always save him a sandwich from lunch, and he'd take it home in his pocket. Yeah. That's what he had for Yeah. And I, and I know there's been lots of efforts in terms of sending food home over the weekends in bags for the kids. That's here in the United States of America. We're the wealthiest country that's ever walked the face of the earth. And we've got kids that are hungry over the weekends. Okay. When I was a jail minister in this town, I had no problem finding people hungry. Yeah, it's, it's all around us. And... My experience is, is I kind of insulate myself and I don't deal with it on a daily basis. And then therefore I forget about it. And, uh, and I don't, I haven't purposely done that. That's just where I'm at, I think. And so <clears throat> we, we need to make an effort. I need to make an effort to be more cognitive of the, of the situations around me. Yeah, Paul. help wanted, you know, uh, uh, now hiring, and then you have people standing on the street corner dressed better than you are, driving a better car, with a yeah. sign out says, need help, God bless you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. It, some of that feeds into that, it, it feeds that contempt that we have. I'm not saying that contempt is displaced necessarily, because what we have to be careful of is not to throw it all in together. Right. There are people that are really hurting, that are really trying, that can't, they're helpless in their situation for whatever reason. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, absolutely. The adults are the ones making the mistakes that put themselves in those situations a lot of times. 
but it's always the children. They're helpless in every situation, right? Okay, let's move on. To Y'all understand the problem, okay? That's the point of this first part here. How rich are we? Well, we need to remember first how rich we are spiritually. First Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Okay? Remember, that's where this needs to start with us, is we need to remember what's been done for us spiritually. Okay? Um, materially, at no time in history has there ever been a greater economic disparity in the world than at present. Speaking specifically about Americans, by any measure, we are the richest people ever to walk planet Earth. Economics professor Steve Corbett and Brian Fiker. Okay. How does the Bible tell us to treat the poor? I'm just going to run through some scriptures here, so bear with me. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever shuts their eyes to the cry of the poor will also poor will also cry out and not be answered. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And then, I didn't put it up here, but I want to reference it. Matthew 20. 25, if you remember the, the scene, it's the judgment scene, right? And uh, he says, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all of his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Does anybody remember what the criteria for judgment is in that verse? Pull it up and look at it if you need to. Sorry? Yeah. Feed, clothe, visit, the sick. That was the only criteria that was used in the judgment. This is straight from Christ's mouth. When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? Remember? 24 spells it out. It says, and hearing this, the ten became indignant. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew 7 isn't too bad either. Yeah, I mean, and, and of course, it's all through the New Testament. I mean, Jesus talks about the poor over and over and over again, okay, about our treatment of them and how how important they are. Okay. Any other comments on that part? All right. So the remedy, what's the what's the difference? What's the biblical approach compared to the cultural approach, which obviously has flaws? More to it than that, John, I think. <laughs> Work hard. Work hard. Now, that might not seem that obvious. Uh, he created work for us, did he not? Right? It was supposed to be a blessing. Now, after we sinned, it got turned into some toil involved with that. But work itself was meant to be a blessing. We were supposed to be uh, find some fulfillment there. It's a gift from Him. It gives us uh, human dignity to some extent, being able to work. And uh, um, He charged us with the creation. We were the steward over everything, if you remember. That was our job. Uh, entrusted us with His uh, with that. Um, but the part I really want to focus on is how work, and this is, this is God's gift, how work contributes to the common good, okay? Now, uh, think of it in terms of um, this building, okay? Or let's make it even simpler. Let's take uh, 
the clothes you're wearing today. How hard would it be for you to put together that set of clothes? From scratch. I'm not saying go to JCPenney's and pick it out. I'm saying to make it. Okay, so I've got a leather belt on. I need a cow <laughs> to kill and skin, cure that leather. I got some leather boots on. I've got uh, the jeans are cotton, so I got to have a cotton patch that I raise cotton on and pick and process. And then I've got to have it woven. I have no idea how to do any of that. Right? I've probably got some nylon on me, so I need some oil and gas product of some sort, I'm sure, here. You see where I'm going with that? How comfortable are our lives because of this blessing of work? And it comes from so many different places, right? It doesn't matter what you do, but you're contributing to the common good. Are you with me? So think about that lazy boy at home, what it would take to for you to build that for yourself or your home itself or this wonderful church house. Okay, those things don't... But because we've got some people that raise cows and some people that raise cotton and some people that raise wheat, think how many people one farmer can feed. Where if you had to go out and do it yourself, raise some wheat, pick it, grind it up, make the bread. <laughs> you get my point? I mean, we don't appreciate how important... <laughs> God's blessing of work is to us. It contributes to the common good. And so the, the first thing that we can do is whatever you do, and it doesn't matter what it is, work hard at it. That's helping people out of poverty. It contributes to the common good of mankind. Right? You with me on that? Comments on that? Um, need to give you my notes here, sorry. It's how we make money. Duh. Right? That's the easiest way to help poor is to contribute some money. Now, it's not always the best way just to give them money. We're going to talk about that as well. But if you're working hard... The, th the great thing about here in America is we've got opportunity. You can take your talents and your intelligence and your uh, drive, and you can take it and form that into wealth here. This is, that's the greatest thing about this country. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is a blessing. But you're supposed to share that wealth, right? And so money, can, money is, a very, is the most powerful tool. Okay. First Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, we've got to compare this to how our culture thinks in terms of uh, work. What does the culture think of work? The world. How do they approach work? It, it, a lot differently in this day and age than they did 20 years ago. Okay. Okay. In terms of maybe we don't work as hard today, is that what you're... Not as hard. Yeah, because I think nowadays... You know, 20 years ago, common labor was still, you know, there was still a lot of trades. Yeah. Nowadays, <clears throat> you, know, you, you could build a house in 90 days. There were so many electricians and plumbers, right. and bricklayers, and both. Nowadays, if you build a house in 100, if you build a house in a year, you can really knock it out. Yeah. And part of that is the, we've moved to a service economy rather than a, a production manufacturing type of economy. You've got more accountants like me that can't build a house. <laughs> Right, that's just dealing in service industry. Okay, so that's part of it. Yeah, um, 
But in terms of why does our culture work? Do they work so that they can help everybody else? We work so that we can quit working at some point, right? I mean, that's it's a means to an end. Everybody's focused on when can I retire, okay? And, uh, and, and that's, the, that's really the only reason for it, other than accumulating stuff while we're working, right? That's the culture's approach to it. Yeah. Yeah. The get rich work quick as yeah. There's, there's no doubt that our work ethic in this country has suffered over the years. And I think that's what Steve's alluding to too, alluding to too. Um, which is going to do what? Before long, uh, nobody's going to be able to produce the things because everybody's just getting them. The common good is going to suffer. Right. I mean, and, and we're probably seeing some of that a little bit. Yeah. In the past, I've had a couple of young people, and I have, I love young people. I love people of all ages, but the attitude, that, it just was like a slap in the face when we owe them. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. supposed to supply this stuff for yeah. them. The attitude, their, their thinking is not quite where it should be. They don't have a good work ethic. Well, and that's something that it's our fault because we have not taught them how to work, right? That's, that was, that's the greatest gift that we can give to our children is to teach them how to work, okay? And, uh, and I think that's a godly thing. I think that's fully appropriate to talk about in Bible classes. That we need to, and we need, they need to understand that this is a gift from God that you've been given, plus the fact that we live in America where you can take work and multiply it into great blessings. Yeah, Steve. It seems like the young people today, they love to work for you. I think that's why, you know, and not getting political, but that's why I think a lot of work for them is so appealing to them because they keep saying, well, we can do free this, free that. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they like that. Yeah. Well, and, and on the flip side, there's there's other circumstances as well. They see mom and dad going to work, working 60 hours a week and not getting very far sometimes too. You know, I mean, there's there's that real struggle out there as well. So, but that's all part of where we're at in America, okay? But in terms of our Christian attitude towards it, what I really want you to remember is work is the answer to a lot of this. It's your part to work hard. Now, we've got this attitude from the world that's creeped in. Just a minute, Jerry, and I'll get to you. That's creeped in in that we think retirement is the... Go. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says retirement is a godly thing. No. Where we're supposed to get to a point where it's okay for me to, to fish and to hunt and to nap every day. Work harder when you retire. Well, <laughs> and I was so looking forward to it. But I, that's not a biblical concept. Am I wrong there? I don't think so. And we've got so many of our elderly people... Don't mean to point any fingers because there's a lot of elderly people here. But in terms of America, that we work, and then once they hit 65 and draw their Social Security check, they quit. Now, in, that's fine for them, but inside the church, we got lots to do. There's lots of places that you can work. The program that we've got coming up is a place for you to work. Okay? And it is scriptural. We are called to work. We can't forget that, and we so often don't. We, we need Bible teachers all the time. All the time there's somebody that needs a class to be taught over here. We've got a congregation of 250 people, and we can't get six teachers signed up. That's shameful. I am pointing a finger. Because... <laughs> That that that's wrong. Steve Steve's the one fighting that battle. I've heard that. I've heard people say, "Well, I did my job. You know, I did my job. I don't have to do that." Yeah, and I get it. I I get it. You get tired. Yeah, I understand. But there's work to do, folks. 
And that's the common good that we bring to the table here. Is if you can't do anything else, you can work hard. And, and, and I know, and I mean, there no more, no one that respects the elderly more than me. But a lot of these, we're not looking for 40 hour a week employees. We're just looking for somebody to drive out of the church sometime in 30 minutes a week. Or just, yeah. I mean, there's so many little things. Little things to keep the circle going. Yeah. You know. And it, it's fine. You can point your finger at the younger generation and maybe you need to preach at them. But in the meantime, hook up and work. Okay? Bring them along with you and teach them how to work. That's the thing. I think we fail as parents teaching our children what needs to be done. Because the Bible doesn't stop there. It says the older women should teach the younger women. Yeah. Younger women teach the younger women. Yeah. There's not an age restriction anywhere in there that I can find. Okay. All right. Yeah. Especially when you finished it, got on there. Step number two. Okay, work hard, live simply. Um, just as the Bible compels us to work hard, it also compels us to live simply. First Timothy six six through eight. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This is so countercultural. Our cultural thinks the more you make, the more you spend, right? It's not the more you make, live simply and give away the rest. That's the gospel formula. The goal here is not to live simply and hoard. It's to live simply and share. That's what is taught in the Bible. She is by no means wealthy at all. Yeah. But she had two daughters. She said that we, when they were little, she goes, I wanted to instill on them on how to share. And she goes, every Christmas, they'd go buy a few presents for us. Then they would, the little, her little kid would pick out the needy kid. Yeah. And they had Bob stuff. So we'd go to a restaurant every Christmas dinner and we'd, we'd eat and we'd let each of my daughters pick out a couple in the restaurant. If they thought we could help, and that's who we would buy dinner for. And she goes, she goes, my kids don't talk about that day. They're 50 years old. And she goes, I don't know how many times that we'd pick somebody out and buy their dinner. And, and the waitress would just tell them, hey, someone yeah. bought your dinner. She goes, two or three times, she goes, they would start crying. We would start crying. And in right. a minute, the whole restaurant was crying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but she said, my daughters to this day, their kids still do the same thing. Yeah, and how valuable lesson they got for 20, 30 bucks in no time, right? And shared that with her children. That's a great story. Thank you. But this idea of, of, of living simply, don't fall into the cultural trap of accumulating stuff, Right? Because it just all that stuff's got to be taken care of, and it zaps your not only your extra money, but your extra time, right? So live simply. Give sacrificially. Second Corinthians eight two through four. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. There's a, um, a clear pattern in the in the New New Testament that prioritizes what our responsibilities are. Okay, um, 
I didn't put this up here. I'm going to summarize these. But 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So our first priority is take care of your own family. Okay? Uh, if your own family needs help, then we're, we're called to provide that help. Okay? Um, and local brothers and sisters, this being also part of our family, I think, as well. Our neighbors, the example of the Good Samaritan, foreign brothers and sisters, this would be our Honduras brothers and sisters is one of the things that we're actually involved with here. Um, my concern is not so much the, the, the giving, it's the sacrificial part. Giving till it hurts, which we have New Testament example of that as I just read, gave beyond their means. What does that mean? We talked about it Wednesday night in Dean's class, the example of the the widow putting in really more than she had to share, even though it wasn't very much. So this idea of giving sacrificially, what does that mean? Don't worry about your next meal, just give it up. Okay, don't worry about your next meal. If it doesn't hurt a little bit, it's probably not enough. Now, I can't tell you what that number is. I have no idea. It's going to be different for every one of us in here. C.S. Lewis, I do not believe one can settle how much one ought, we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot because our charity's expenditure excludes them. Ouch. Go to adding up how much you spend on TV and movies and eating out and vacations. I'm talking about me. Paul? If you take someone that has more money than he's got cents to give away $1,000, it doesn't mean anything. No. You know? Uh, pick on Donald Trump. If he gave somebody a million dollars, he's not going to miss it. If somebody that only is in the poverty level of twenty six thousand a year, and they have to give a thousand dollars away, that's going to hurt. Yeah, yeah. So this this idea of giving until it <laughs> until you feel it, right? It needs to hurt just a little bit. Otherwise, it's not really giving sacrificially. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting there. No, nope, you're fine. That's a perfect lead-in. Thank you. Help constructively. Okay? Because um, I'm, I'm about out of time. i got two more here. Help constructively. Supplement the responsible instead of subsidizing the irresponsible. Instead of helping people get through the day, look for ways to help them get through their lives. And that's spiritually here as well, not just physically. Scripture does not call us to rescue lazy people from poverty. Okay, That's not our job, not to rescue lazy people. This goes back to what you were talking about. Some of these men in these shelter, I've had a little exposure down there. That's the lifestyle they've chosen. They're happy to live there. They, When they get kicked out of this shelter, they'll go to Tulsa, and then they'll make the loop back to Oklahoma City, Ardmore, Dallas, and then come back through. That's just who they are, where they want to be. I have no responsibility to them because I don't feel like as a Christian to help lazy people that don't want to work. But there's a lot of people that can't work, disabilities, mental problems. A lot of the homeless people suffer from mental problems. And we may look down on them because they don't have a home, but they can't put thoughts together long enough to buy a home. <laughs> right? Well, 
hard to maintain. They can't make their own living because they're incapacitated by mental illness to a larger degree. Okay. And a lot of that mental illness is also self-medicated with drugs and drink and so forth. And, we, and we, instead of, and, I, and I'm, I'm really asking you to wrestle with, and I'm, this is coming from me personally, my contempt for the poor at times and my contempt for these people in these situations. I don't know their story and I shouldn't prejudge those who they are. Okay. And I don't think I'm the only one that does that. Try to help in a way that empowers them to fulfill their purpose God created them for. And I'm, I'm just going to push through this because we're about out of time. People are poor for different reasons, so they must be helped in different ways. Okay? Not one, there's not one solution that fits every situation. The real hard part for me is you have to get personally involved and when you do that, it gets really sticky because it demands more time and it demands more effort, right? Amen. And it, it just, it, it, takes, it takes something from you, okay? And that's part of that giving sacrificially. But we've got to be willing to do that because not every situation is the same. It can't all be fixed with a check. Invest eternally. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Mark 10, 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure on heaven and come and follow me. Now, this is the story of the rich young man. And oftentimes we look at that and we think about how big that sacrifice he's, Jesus is asking him to make. That's almost unreasonable. What if he asked you to go and sell everything and give to the poor? Would you be able to do that? <laughs> wow. No, I probably would not be able to do that. But we have to understand what he's asking him. What He's not telling him, He's, he's asking him to come and put your treasure for something better. Right? That's right. He said, I'm going to give you something better. Remove this and I'll give you something that's worth more. A better treasure. An eternal treasure. One that's not going to last just for a few years, but forever. And then we've got to get to that mindset of eterni eternity. That all these things that we do to help the poor is investing eternally. Not just for them, it can be for just for them, but also for ourselves. Okay. It's like the man that had the pearl of great value and sold everything about the pearl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we worry about, isn't it? Now you're in the same boat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's why we have to we have to have a change of heart with what we have. I suspect the young man's identity was tied to his riches. Yes. And he's asking him to give up who you are. Yes. And that's still true, isn't it? Yeah. That's still that's getting your priorities. Are we we get our we get our identity, who we are is tied into what we have rather than who has saved our souls. We're supposed to be the children of God and, and Christ is our Lord. That's who we are. That's where our identity lies in this money and these riches take over that spot in our lives. So Greg, thank y'all. Greg, is that that song, Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All? Yeah, that's a good, yeah. <laughs>